Hello and welcome to episode 16 of season 2 of AS for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick. In this week's episode, I spoke with Gavork Hartunian, Professor Emeritus of Architecture at the University of Canberra, Australia, about his 2012 book, Architecture and Spectacle, a Critique, published by Routledge in 2012. That's why modern architecture remains a kind of something strange at, that, at its beginning, because its aesthetics uh, was very uh, exclusive to architecture. But today, this aesthetic of fetishism, of commodities, or spectacle, it's something that we experience everywhere. And one of my things I try to communicate with my students is that notion of the cool. Everything for us today, we like it, we say it's cool, but truly also we can define what do, what do we mean by that cool. I think what we mean is that recognition of the domination of image and idea image building or image making as a prominent issue in architecture, but also culture by law. A is for architecture podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and good morning and welcome to another episode of A's for Architecture. I'm talking today to Professor Gevork Hartunian. Um, Professor, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I was uh, born as an Armenian in Iran and I got my master's degree in architecture in Iran, and then moved to America to get my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, after that, I practiced architecture in America. And also I taught at different institutions, architecture in schools of architecture, like uh, Columbia University, Pratt Institute, which they were located in New York City, but also uh, other schools of architecture in different states in America. Uh, up to 2000, that uh, I got a nice offer from University of Sydney, and I moved to Australia. Uh, and in 2003, there was a better offer at University of Canberra, so I started teaching uh, art history of architecture and design studio until a year and a half ago that I got retired as Emiratis professor of architecture history. And during this long time period of my career, I have published a number of books, uh, uh, which one of them that I started picking up on Gottfried Samper and this issue of the tectonics uh, is titled Ontology of Construction, which was published in 1994 by Cambridge University Press. Uh, so when book, when you when you set out as an architect, what what drew you into the what drew you into the field of theory specifically? Was it just a sort of opportunistic thing or was there something specific about and, and, and the, the reason I ask this is the book that I, I contacted you to to talk to you about your book Architecture and Spectacle a critique pub, mm. published by Ashgate in 2000 and when is it 2013 Six. 2000 Six and then, yeah, that was uh, 2006 and then uh, uh, Rutledge took over Ashgate and they uh, published in 2012 and then 16th was the third expanded edition that is available out there. Because yeah so in that book and in the very very beginning of that book you talk about the role of the, well <clears throat> you say teaching of architectural history and theories appears to be divorced from practice um, and your book you hope, um, and we'll talk about some of the themes of it. But the book you hope will help sort of mend that. What, what did you did you experience that in practice? That practice was increasingly something that had little to say about theory, or 
little encounter with theory? Yeah, actually, this is a good question because I'm publishing a book by Rutledge uh, due January 2023 titled Towards a Critique of Architecture's Contemporaneity for Essays. In that book, I have explained uh, my interest, uh, why I was interested in Semper, and that goes back to the time that I was graduate student in Iran. Mm -hmm. And it was very important for me at that time to think about what's the relation of architecture to technology. Uh, and for me at that time, uh, technology was uh, understood as a structural system. Mm -hmm. uh, and that remained in my mind and I tried to explore the subject uh, when I was a PhD student mm -hmm. at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And until I came across uh, a dissertation, uh, Harry Francis Mulgrave has written about Gottfried Semper. And I find that very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And uh, that became the motivation to take several architects like Frank Leroy, uh, Miss Van der Rohe, and others and discuss their architecture uh, in Ontology of Construction, which published in 1994 as the beginning of my engagement with this issue. And what it becomes then uh, in further developed in both the first edition of the architecture spectacle as crisis of the object and then architecture of spectacle as critique is this notion of the uh, the, the difference of Semper as a 19th century German architects uh, makes between theatricality and theatricalization. Uh, that to me became a fascinating subject, looking, reading Semper in the context of the, uh, the like the turn of the century where the issue of spectacle, as discussed by Guy Dubois, it becomes a prominent uh, critical take on the culture of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So there's um, a lot of there's a, there's a lot of very complicated ideas threaded through that. I mean, most architectural students engage with Semper through four myths, the four elements. Sorry. If they, as I said in my email to you before, if they encounter him at all, it's one of these people that's sort of, I think, rather falling off the end of architecture as we um, as we go forward. But to move and and you know that that idea that Semper articulates in the the four elements, very elegant origin story for where architecture comes from. Um, very enticing, very Victorian. Um, and um, but to move it all the way through to talking about theories of tectonic, uh, uh, the tectonics and theatricality, maybe you could li uh, li um, unpack that a little bit. What do we? How do we get from Semper to this particular notion? We get there to, as a historian. Uh, I have tried to make and learning from Walter Benjamin's uh, philosophy of history. I tried to make some analogies between contemporary situation and the 19th century mm -hmm. uh, theories of architecture. Mm -hmm. Because 19th century uh, historiographically still is very important for architecture today. Uh, that, uh, because it's a time that uh, a lot of issues that we deal with today particularly the issue of technology. It started from 19th century and uh, uh, aesthetically also the whole issue of the, uh, the style because uh, a prominent discourse in 19th century uh, authors who were 
both uh, had philosophical motivation, but also they were architects. The issue what was as uh, was discussed in what style to build today, and that was the reason was that uh, the architects were facing these uh, new materials like steel, iron, uh, and they didn't know how to formulate that aesthetically. Mm -hmm. Because in terms of construction, engineers had already done that. Uh, like even if you recall Crystal Palace as one of the highlight of the 19th century uh, introduction, new building typologies, exhibition halls, uh, and the use of the steel and glass mm -hmm. for the first time in a large scale building that was not used like a machine house for engineering, but it has uh, this uh, notion of the creating an interior space for display of objects. And Semper then comes as a person who at that time was in England uh, and contributed to the exhibition, even he designed the uh, Canadian section for that uh, Crystal Palace uh, uh, exhibition. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that becomes very important then related to this idea of the theatricality uh, because the, our sense of commodities, this uh, notion of the commodification today, which is very visible for us. And the way Guy de Wall talks about it uh, as a suggestion, which is we experience it, it uh, it's all over the culture. There is nothing outside of that. But that also has uh, created the different relationship between object and subject. And the aesthetic becomes one of that uh, relationships. But also, if we, one of the examples I talked with my student is that if you open Le Corbusier towards a new architecture, he already in 25, 1925, hints that issue of the aesthetic. And his examples are engineering, that the engineering are uh, already have dealt with this issue of the technology and new materials. And according to him, architects are behind that. If they don't move it, uh, they're going to lose their, their historical task. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why he ended up designing the frame structure, domino frame. Uh, and, and if you look at his work, the early work that he built before domino frame, they are quite conventional, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But after that, then he formulated the five points of architecture. That became the motto of the what we, we were taught at uh, history books, the international uh, architecture, the language of it, basically, the, uh, Johnson and Hitchcock with their, with their 1932 exhibition at MoMA, basically was to solidify uh, local Rousseau's five points of architecture. That's why at that point they didn't know what to do with Franklin Wright because he was playing a different music, mm -hmm. uh, eccentric in a way, mm -hmm. and coming practicing in America. So therefore, uh, that notion of technology and aesthetic uh, was an issue initiated from. 19th century, and Le Corbusier was the first to formulate it uh, in the context of uh, modern architecture. Uh, but he also has a statement there that he says that if you use this material is good, you use that technology is good, but then you do something, it touches my heart. That is architecture, mm -hmm. but he never defined how, what you have to do to touch his heart, you know. So that aesthetic issue remained ambiguous at that time. 
Uh, and today, of course, we see this visibility of uh, uh, aesthetic of fetishism of commodities uh, is uh, prominent in uh, current or last 20 years turn to digitalization of architecture. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly we are experiencing, or everybody, even the public, experiencing an aspect of aesthetics in uh, movie theater, movies, in art and architecture that they are familiar with. That. That's why uh, modern architecture remains uh, kind of something strange at, at, at its beginning, because its aesthetics uh, was very uh, exclusive to architecture. Mm -hmm. But today, this uh, aesthetic of fetishism of commodities or spectacle, it's something that we experience uh, everywhere. And one of my uh, uh, things I try to communicate with my student is that uh, notion of the cool. Uh, everything for us today, we like it, we say it's cool, but truly also we can define what do, what do we mean by that cool, mm. uh, which I think what we mean is that uh, recognition of the domination of image and the uh, idea of image building or image making as a prominent uh, issue of the uh, architecture, but also uh, culture by large. Yeah. So, now, how then Semper, go back to your question, comes into this is that uh, for me, when I read Semper, I was so impressed by it and I was very delighted because in a way, uh, the way I wrote it in Ontology of Construction is that Semper deconstructed the whole issue of architecture particularly his uh, four elements of architecture, which associates them, its motive with four industries, carpentry, textile, ceramics, and uh, masonry. This was a very radical uh, dissociation of architecture from fine arts mm -hmm. that even uh, a lot of early historians still uh, were talking about architecture in relation to painting and sculpture. Uh, even Pevsner does that. So that aspect of Samper's discussion for me was very radical. And uh, uh, But also what was radical that it just questioned the whole issue of the origin of architecture which was always discussed in terms of a uh, uh, heart or other subjects uh, like that. Mm -hmm. So th suddenly he introduced this uh, association of architecture with industry, which even today we are still uh, in a, a different level. We are related to that uh, and to my dislike, even at uh, academia today. They talk about architecture as industry uh, or practice as an industry rather than talking about as a profession. Mm. Because the building industry has an industry mm. which is totally dissociated with the uh, practice of architecture. Mm. They, they design now uh, the fenestration, all kinds of technologies of uh, surfaces making which architects borrow that or they consult with them uh, and they choose almost there are catalogs for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but this uh, association uh, has gone even to that extreme that uh, architecture, uh, even architecture firms today that I have lots of colleagues talking to them, they talk about uh, architecture as an industry, mm. which to me is misleading. And that's one of the issues that they talking about architecture as industry, then it takes uh, their, their drawing line between architecture history theory and 
practice. Mm. So Semper's so Semper's association of architecture and these crafts situates the production of architecture in a much more um what's the word native kind of practice or normative practice of everyday life i'm i'm just trying to work out what his critique points to because if and i think this is a wonderful point you make if in if engineering has all or made already almost resolved the issues of aesthetics in architecture by the time architects get their head around it by the time Le Corbusier is dealing with his international style, his five points. As you say, you know, Paxton has already kind of resolved it. Um, uh, what's his name? Abraham Darby of Colville in, in, in Colebrookdale has already resolved the issue of, of um, what we can do. So architects are, in a way, playing catch up and they're having to redefine their practice. And they're also moving away from an architecture which is inherently dependent upon material character, the, the character of materials. So they're starting to have to think about things like dressing architecture. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That brings to this issue of theatricality. Okay. What does theatricality yeah. uh, we get out of Semper is uh, that the building is not what we see. The building has is a Construct, there is a constructed form and there is a representational uh, cladding of that. That comes, if you look at the entire history of architecture from the Roman all the way up to uh, 19th century, we see this repetition of classical language of architecture. But uh, if you look at their planimetric organization, you can see that that there is what I call thickening or what uh, Louis can call thickening of the wall, because there is in, in the walls of those buildings, Renaissance architecture up to late 18th century, if you look at their plans, we have a part that is masonry construction, mm -hmm. uh, basically uh, brick or stone uh, load bearing walls. And there is a layer that added to it. That's the cladding. Mm. At that time, uh, we would look at it based on as a representational aspect of architecture. Yes. So what is Semper offering is radicalizing this or bringing to our attention these two dual aspects, that there is a constructed form and there is a representational appearance of architecture. So in 19th century, considering there were two issues, then on the one hand was that, uh, okay, we have all these new technologies, we have steel, we have glass, we have concrete. What is the constructed form of it? Second is that, what is that representational of this form? You know, and that's why, uh, up to Le Corbusier, that was not uh, theorized. Although maybe there are buildings that they were all architects, they were already thinking about this issue. But Le Corbusier is the first person uh, to, to theorize this, uh, this subject uh, as such. So in that duality, uh, then this issue of the cladding becomes important. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, and part of my discussion has been to make different differences between dressing and dressed up. So, dressing comes from Adolf Lopes. Adolf Lopes talks about cladding and also uh, the notion of dressing uh, of his buildings. You know? mm -hmm. uh, therefore, uh, the dressing is the one that, like, uh, the suit I wear, uh, all the lines and cuts uh, somehow directly or indirectly follows the uh, kind of morphology of the body. Uh, whereas dressed up becomes covering. 
that this regard of the body become like uh, I have talked uh, uh, in some of my publications about the uh, uh, carnival as dressing, mm. which is uh, te for temporary use, but it's uh, fancy food. Uh, and to me, that's theatricalization when it comes to architecture. Uh, that uh, uh, the image is almost become uh, itself an object. It is not related to the object behind of behind it's uh, behind of it. Uh, even Gottfried Semper talks that the mask is useless if it does doesn't relate to the face. Yes. So therefore, that distinction becomes uh, important. Uh, how to do that? But again, back to this notion of structure. Uh, we have to mention also another German architect, Karl Bottiger. Uh, Karl Bottiger uh, was the first German architect to make this distinction between core form and the art form, constructed form and artistic form of architecture. Of course, for example, we don't have that distinction in vernacular architecture. No. That's also uh, interesting to mention here. Now, at, so basically what, what the Bottice was saying that the Mason, we have exhausted through history the tectonic potentialities of masonry construction system. And the new tectonics we should seek in steel architecture uh, structures. But again, uh, architects uh, were not at point to kind of think about it and imagine it, uh, what should be the kind of cladding or the artistic form of the uh, this new structural system. So to me, in retrospective uh, historiography, on the one hand, we have uh, Le Corbusier that theorized the new artistic dimension for architecture, five points of architecture, basically the horizontal window, but most importantly was his uh, emphasis on surface, which in a way, to me, uh, is, I have mentioned in all different writings that Le Corbusier re-territorialized the Renaissance architecture with a new emphasis on uh, surface, which Alberti in his 10 books of architecture discusses the importance of that. Mm. And we can see in this architecture, but it is a miss that response to directly to the 19th century question, what is the aesthetic of the steel and glass architecture? And he comes to that when he moves to America. That's why his latest work, uh, particularly the National Gallery, is basically a response to uh, what also Bottice says that if you want to respond to the uh, tectonic of the steel, we have to go back to Hellenic period and look at the relationship between column and uh, beam in their architecture. And I think to me, uh, Miss responded to that in 50s. So there is this uh, interesting thing to me as far as tectonic is concerned, historical gap uh, between Le Corbusier's response to continue, how to recode the Renaissance uh, aspects of the culture of building, so to speak, and the myths in America who try to answer to uh, 19th century late towards his uh, latest work. Yeah. And that's why from the uh, 50 by 50 house to 
Berlin National Gallery, everything is the same uh, type of the plan, square shape plan, different, of course, scale, but also the separation between column and the enclosure, uh, all those things. Uh, uh, to me, that becomes very interesting. And then in this paradigm, then when we look at the uh, kind of architect, digitalization of architecture, then uh, the issue becomes the cover. One more time, we have surface, return of surface mm -hmm. in digital architecture, but now is not cladding as, as such, but it is like covering the thing. Mm. And that's why it's, it's not dre it's not dress it's dressing up it's a it's a dressing up exactly mm. uh, or covering because mm. covering is almost like uh, a free uh, fabric so to speak that can cover something whatever is beneath it mm. it's almost so, it's almost with some of this the so so the way that you've your book is laid out is with a theoretical introduction and then you work through a series of architects of major architects of the of the spec the age of the spectacle the late 20th and early 21st century bernard shumi rem zaha hadid frank Gehry, of course um and peter eisenman but also and i think this is quite interesting stephen hall as well and i perhaps we should come on to stephen hall at a certain point because I guess as a phenomenologist, that would make sense of him being included. I just, I think he sits in a more polite area of architecture than perhaps some That's of these. That's important about Stephen Hall, because uh, Stephen Hall's architecture uh, at one point became a very tectonic and uh, this part of the game, tectonic is the excess in architecture. Uh, and uh, Semper talks about excess, but he talks about lawful. Uh, excess in architecture. Lawful. Uh, lawful, yes. It, it's almost like that mask. Yeah. That if the mask has nothing to do with the face, then it's not mask, so yeah. to speak. Or it's, so there was an excess from the beginning in Stephen Hall's uh, architecture, which I was very much interested. But we jump into his latest work, it has become I would suggest something Baroque. Uh, his uh, work, all this uh, uh, treatment he does, uh, because I'm not that much fascinated with his phenomenological interpretation of architecture. But for example, the examples I have mentioned in the book are the ones that this notion of cut becomes one of the aesthetic elements. And the cut, if you uh, look at those uh, project, it's almost curtails or, uh, uh, or cut short the expansion of the uh, kind of uh, spectacle to its full force. You know, or mm -hmm. the, uh, because there is this dynamic dimension in digital architecture. Mm -hmm. We can animate, there are animated and that's why in the book I talk about return of organic. Mm. In, uh, uh, but that aspect also you can see in the design of the cars. They look like animals sometimes. Yeah. Sign cars. Anyway, so th there is this uh, uh, animated dimension, but in those buildings I have mentioned and discussed in the book, uh, there is this element of the cut. Uh, uh, so uh, that to me at that time was very interesting mm. as a resistance against the completion of the uh, this animation towards a form that uh, stand on its own based on complete uh, uh, kind of uh, animation of the surface. Yeah, uh, and, the, and this theme of resistance. Um... And it's the point, uh, I, the point that you make at the end, I think, of the chapter on Geary. Um, and you, you, you say something, it's very useful as uh, someone reading a book to find a sentence where you're like, aha, I've got it. Um, 
but you you say a resistance to critically engaging with and making meaningful additions to the present urban structure is perhaps the common thread running through the work of most architects discussed in this vol volume. Either they maintain a cynical position against the failure of the project of modernity or try to capture that aspect of the age of digital reproductivity that we've associated with architecture of theatricalization. So I like this idea that perhaps what we see in the work of people like Hull and, and in the work of people like Coolhouse is in a way they're using surface and theatricality of dressing up as a way of contesting and critiquing as you call it, the failure of the modern project. I guess, I guess there's, a, again, a whole host of things embedded in there, like what is the modern project and why did it fail or, or did it fail? And then how do these, how do these architects articulate, articulate a critique in a meaningful... How, how, do you, how do you critique a system when you are the system? I'm, I often I use the example of one of Rem Koolhaas's building, his CCTV building in in Beijing, which either I imagined or I read somewhere is sort of like a Laocoon. It's like the great sculpture of the Laocoon, a man struggling with this giant monster, and the building is sort of it's a it's a CCTV building for the Communist Party of China. I mean. If that's not selling out, I don't know what is. And yet he makes the building sort of critique the political situation that's going on. So I, I was just wondering if you could perhaps talk a little bit about this, what you mean by this idea of a resistance and how Semperian ideas of theatricality, of surface, are used in this way. You're touching a very essential question which basically to me goes back to the relation between architecture and the city. Mm -hmm. That's the core of that discussion is the architecture and, and the city, which has been with us since 60s. And I say since, since 60s because uh, when architects and uh, thinkers, uh, they try to address the subject it means the subject is, has attained a domination that we can formulate uh, major aspects of it. And in regard to architecture and city, I'm thinking about Aldo Rossi's architecture city in 1966, mm -hmm. uh, which is particular take about almost saying that architecture doesn't have any meaning if it's not embedded in the history of the city or they are, there's no cohesive relationship between these two uh, things. Or uh, I'm reminded also Kevin Leach, the image of the city in the 60s. Mm -hmm. There are a series of these books uh, or Colin Rose, Polaris City in 1979. Uh, if we go further, we have Rem Koolhaas's Delirious New York 1978 and Bernard Shumi Manhattan transcript uh, in 1981. So when we look at these things, if you read all these books, there is nothing they are offering as a solution to this historical uh, problem, this dissociation of architecture from urban structure, or the minimum role if architecture can uh, play uh, in the current urban structure, uh, which is basically uh, being dominated by uh, profit-making uh, aspects of capitalism in terms of the land value and how to make investment that gives returns more uh, capital out of it. Uh, and Architects has become a victim of this because part of that investment is not just the, uh, the money, uh, economic, but is cultural too. Mm. How to bring star architects to do those works that, uh, that, that public, and unfortunately 90% of the public doesn't have architectural education. 
unfortunately, that's one of the other aspects of our culture we are living in. So it's just this culture of spectacle that mm. they, it makes them, everybody who went to visit, for example, uh, Frank Gehry's Bilbao Museum. The Bilbao was a small town, unfamiliar, nobody, even I went there to see, of course, for the writing of this uh, book to visit uh, uh, the museum over there. And since then, it has created huge revenue for the city. So that becomes that part of how the architecture relation to city is channeled, uh, which once upon a time, it was supposed to be through civic aspects of culture, which unfortunately today is gone. Mm -hmm. Or even if you look at an institution like a Museum of Modern Art in New York City, it has expanded, one wonders why to that extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then of course, it becomes a building type, almost like a, a shopping mall that we go there, we are attracted to it. Uh, and of course there are commodities, now it's art. Uh, and we go there, uh, of course we can get educated and walk out of it. But that phenomena of expansion, because the artwork hasn't developed to that extreme, that it has to Museum of Modern Art has to triple its size and volume in order to do that. So there are these aspects of the commodification that the architecture has become itself a commodity. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the system treats it almost like other commodities, how to be more attractive mm -hmm. uh, to consumers. And uh, so the other way to say this, uh, if you look at, for example, the tower of our Caesar has designed in for Manhattan, uh, it's quite, uh, you can see big differences between that tower and, uh, for example, the, the uh, CCTV in, yeah. uh, in Beijing. So therefore, uh, Whereas in Caesar's work, he tries to somehow recall some traditional aspects of the good uh, high-rise building. One of them, it has two facades responding to both streets because it's a corner uh, lot. Uh, whereas uh, in other cases, they are more concerned with formalistic aspects like uh, uh, CCTV is basically how to create a new vertical building. Yeah. Uh, or even Peter Eisman's uh, proposal for Berlin that the tower comes up, uh, kind of turns around and comes down. Uh, it was that formalistic thing. And uh, part of this, again, problem of this spectacle and the uh, in urban context is that uh, we, because architects were pushed out of the decision making process of the city, then they uh, try to emphasize on the, or theorize architecture based on autonomy. Mm -hmm. So architecture becomes a, a autonomous object uh, even if you look at the lyrics in New York, uh, Rem Kulas in that book, uh, or the proposals he make, he accepts the grid system, he accepts the block. What he does is to look, to put uh, different towers at the top of those blocks uh, as he designed that, you mm. know. So therefore, that itself was a telling story uh, to that uh, architects can't do anything uh, in regard to the uh, capitalistic structure of the city. Mm. But of course, way back in 1970, English edition of Tafuri's architecture 
and utopia design and capitalist development, he explores this in the detail mm -hmm. and goes back to the beginning of modernism in architecture, local Rousier's work, uh, all that. So therefore, uh, there is this historical dimension uh, which uh, capitalism has created for us, which is inevitable. Uh, and that uh, makes uh, this situation of uh, theatricalization and the spectacle as part of the crisis of object. Yeah. You know, so on the one hand, to me, we have a city as an architect, we have no role in its development. On the other hand, is the issue of architecture uh, yeah. as a component of this. Uh, and the second one, the, the city, then it becomes, the architecture then becomes the issue of the spectacle mm. to be uh, contributing to that structure, which is uh, basically uh, profit incentive oriented interventions. And so, and so the, the Semperian idea of a dressed building, a building dressed by architecture, a structure, sorry, dressed by architecture in a way, is we have deviated from that as we have pursued this surface-based, digitally modeled and digitally imagined architecture. And this, this, cre this, cre this creates a, it's an unhappy tension. It's a, it's not, a, you know, as you, as you say, we have, as architects, we have been sort of ex slowly excluded from discussions around the city, but at the same time, we have excluded ourselves. And part of that self-exclusion is being involved in this idea of producing spectacles. And I was thinking about it as you were talking, I was thinking about this idea of get dressed versus dressing up. At Mardi Gras or at, you know, um, uh, festivals like that, people dress up in fabulous clothing and they become, they, through this dressing up, they transform the city into a space of um, uh, pleasure, excess, um, hyper-reality, surrealism, all of these things. But the city itself is transformed by these incidents of people wearing extreme wear. No clothing, too much clothing, all of that kind of stuff, music and so on. And architecture in a way, this spectacle-based architecture, seems to me to serve that function in that it obscures, and I think this is Guy Debord's point, is it obscures the reality of the capitalist city, city per se. It's a sort of device for, um, it's sort of, what's it? Bread and circuses, isn't it? It's kind of like mm. capitalism employs these architects to do this thing so that we don't notice the organizing and um, essentially essentially authoritarian or autocratic nature of capitalist urban space. That's true. That's why uh, to recall my friend, Kenneth Franklin has this point that architects should feel responsibility towards mm. what they are doing. Mm. You know? So that's where the issue of the critical practice becomes important. Mm. What kind of uh, practice one choose to conduct, for example, person like Alvaro Caesar mm. uh, in contemporary architecture uh, the, has resisted this total submission to this uh, aesthetic of spectacle. Mm. Now, of course, there is always limits because this has we have internalized aspects of this uh, into our subjectivity as well. Mm. No one can deny it that uh, aspects that you mentioned as the carnivalesque appearances, that they are not, they are bad or ugly. Uh, but then the issue is that within uh, this uh, historical, as a historian, uh, how to critique this. Now, my own discourse, it provides students a way of thinking to be aware of what we are doing. 
are not telling them what to do in a way. No. Uh, but it's a critical perspective on contemporaneity of architecture. Uh, and that is important uh, as an educator and uh, a person who teaches architectural history and studio even, that how to educate architects to be critical, uh, but what they, or to have a critical understanding of what they are doing. Mm. And unfortunately, these days, in most of schools of architecture, at least some of them, I, I'm familiar in Australia, but I think even in America and other places they do, they have reduced this entire complex issue of the technology and architecture to like environmental issue uh, or uh, purely sustainability issues uh, without uh, kind of uh, looking on historical aspects of it. You know, we are tearing the facades of a lot, lots of buildings and dressing up a new with new sustain, sort of covering that has, uh, to some extent, a response to a kind of uh, climate issue, uh, that, that kind of thing. So history and theory is pushed out almost because all those things, uh, the design of it is done by building industry. Uh, or the, to me, the fashionable thing that everybody tries to build, use wood in structure and also in cladding of the building. 20 years ago, we were talking about deforestation uh, of the uh, of wood. Uh, but where does this wood comes from? It comes from forest. Uh, it's not industrially produced wood, uh, but it is cut into forest and uh, we use them in building. So it, it is a, a kind of a pedagogical issue, this mm. discussion of tectonic theatricality and how that differs from theatricalization. But again, uh, everything comes to this notion of technology and architecture. And it goes back even to Theodore Adorno's discussion of uh, technification, that he started criticizing jazz music because they would use uh, electronic techniques to make the sound uh, much better than the natural sound of the instrument. Mm. So that technification, now it has become part of every aspect of our cultural production, yeah. including architecture through digitalization. Yes. It's... um. Yes, this is absolutely true. And it's, I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, it's because it it's really good for business. If you can persuade people that the sound of their LP isn't as clear as the sound of their CD, and then their CD is not as clear as the sound of their MP3, and it's not as clear as the sound of the digital file, then they'll just keep buying the same album over and over again in ever more refined. And like the human ear is only so good. And when we listen to music, we don't, actually listen in that way is one of the discussions i have with my wife is about um, hd tv hd tv is dreadful it's far too clear the human eye doesn't see like that that's not what we want to see i don't want to see the pimples on julia roberts face i want to see julia roberts as a kind of you know like like a botticelli's venus you know it's like a, an image of sort of soft focused beauty and that's why she is who she is and then all of a sudden HDTV, and you think, oh dear, poor old Julia Roberts, <laughs> too much makeup. So there is that, that. That is a really interesting thing. But it seems to me that you're saying, and you've mentioned this earlier, this issue around the crisis of the object, which is a really fascinating thing in itself. It seems to me that you're saying that we're getting back with this technification, this drive to a sort of uninterrogated um, environmentalism. We're getting back to a new crisis of the object that we are no, as architects, we are no longer masters of our own product. 
and that the product is being defined, the product of architecture and, and urban space is being defined by forces that are way outside our competence that don't even communicate with us. It's in fact being defined by legislators, which is to say lawyers, um, and it's being defined by policymakers, and it's being defined by think tanks. And then architecture comes in at this last moment and tries to put some dressing up on it. Yes, that's uh, that's exactly the, the point. And uh, the, the thing is that uh, uh, it has become almost uh, within this uh, totality that capitalism has created hard even to find an uh, answer uh, beyond what we see happening mm -hmm. as a major architect's contribution. Nevertheless, there are some architects uh, everywhere, I think in each country, uh, that they do feel responsible mm. uh, to what, how to respond to this technification of uh, architecture. But they are uh, remain minority, uh, and I think it's task of the uh, historians and critique to uh, address this issue. Uh, one of the interesting thing to me is again, if you look at uh, Kenneth Frampton's fifth edition of the Critical History, uh, the entire new added chapter deals with architecture in what we call it non-Western societies, because in those cultures, uh, it's like uh, they have still this dream that they have a tradition. Uh, but at the same time, they accepted this capitalist culture. Uh, but there is this dichotomy that still in their, uh, in those uh, uh, national setup, still uh, there is a duality between uh, modernized, the capitalistic modernization and uh, what they consider is their tradition, mm. whether correct or wrong, mm. illusion or true. Uh, but it is that dichotomy that they are struggling with it. There yeah. are lots of architects in China, for example, Wang Shu for one of them, uh, but there's lots of other young architects that uh, against the government's uh, inclination, they are doing small projects. They are not doing this uh, spectacular large scale mm -hmm. project, which inevitably also, it, it goes out of control of architects because architecture as a craft oriented uh, phenomenon, it has limits. Yes. Uh, it has limits how to respond to uh, the, the load that capitalism wants to put on architecture today. Mm. Yes. You know? uh, and that expansion it becomes to the point that maybe uh, there is no other choice but we cover the whole thing with something. Mm. You know? Instead of articulating the Semperian uh, challenge, the differences between constructed form and the dressing. Mm. So the dress up becomes maybe, uh, or it is for lots of architects, the solution. And uh, at best, how to animate that uh, cover that becomes uh, more popular as far as uh, public consumption of these forms and architecture. So, yeah, I, I'm... Semper has a lot to say for us now. I was wondering also this idea, this... something you were talking about, this idea of capitalism is placing too much pressure on architecture in a way. Architecture can't do this. Or asking too much from architecture. Yeah, it's asking too much from, from it. And and in a way, it debases it, and that will become intolerable to, at a certain point, and that will lead to... Now, capitalism is very good at turning everything to its advantage. I mean, it's its genius. Che Guevara t-shirts, 
being sold and uh, you know the, the kind of commodification of communism for example is a case in point but I do wonder about this we, we, we seem to be approaching and you you point out with these architects these critical practitioners who are doing smaller scale things more detailed things and your example of the tower block in in New, in Manhattan by Alvaro Caesar is probably a very good example of someone who's in a way crossing the great divide between architecture at scale and also art, architecture which is a critical practice but I, I'm minded of um, Ernst Gombrich's book um, The Preference for the Primitive where he talks about and he traces uh, it's an art, histori- art, art history book but he talks about the way that and he traces this story of how since the ancients there's been this tendency towards um, decay in cultural practices of excess, which is the same as decay. And then this desire to kind of simplify and cut down. And Gombrich does that for us, doesn't he? He provides a a mechanism for understanding the rudimentary qualities of what it is as architects we are supposed to be trying to achieve. So he teaches us something and he's a, a, a useful device for reframing our own practice against the capitalist takeover of space and against the spectacle. Sure, uh, that's uh, that's one of the issues that uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years I've been uh, thinking and still writing about uh, about Gottfried Samper and mm. uh, basically this uh, not to propose how to architects design, but especially at the pedagogical level to encourage students and young architects to look at the architecture from a critical point of view, Mm -hmm. to understand why we are doing certain things that is happening in all the the cosmopolitan cities. So I think uh, that's a one aspect of it. The other is that uh, this ongoing modernization, which today has uh, attained its capitalistic dimension, uh, is again interesting subject to look at non-Western cultures, how they are doing about that. Mm. Because uh, one of my uh, learnings also from my peers who have taken a Marxian approach to architecture, but in a broader perspective about modernization, uh, is, for example, to discuss or to map the temporality of uh, architecture, particularly in what stages a country or a nation enters to the process of modernization. For me, China is a late comer. Mm. That's why their uh, architecture, the major, their practice of their architects is different from Japan. Japanese were, came to modernization in 20s. So they were able to carry on certain aspects of tradition even today. And somewhere I have written in a uh, uh, afterward to a book on Japanese architecture that uh, that's why whenever uh, architects in the West were in crisis, Japanese had a different solution for it. You know, if you look at uh, what uh, people like Sejima is doing, or other architects from Izuzaki on, uh, we can see that uh, even if it's not a, a solution that we would like, but they are doing different response to this situation because they are still able to uh, think within the past and present aspects of their own culture. That's why then it is a good point to expand our historiography to bring 
uh, to students' attention what is happening in other countries uh, that once upon a time we call them underdeveloped uh, or developing countries at best uh, because this dichotomy uh, because their culture is not totally commodified yet. But to look at Iran, where I was, I'm coming from, there is a huge comp confusion about this uh, kind of religious system and values with uh, modernization and the architecture that they are designing. Hmm. So, uh, and there are many countries like that, uh, that uh, if we look at their uh, architects, young architects, that they are committed and they are conscious about critical importance of critical practice in architecture. Then maybe this kind of uh, discussions and uh, writing would become useful at least to uh, enhance their knowledge about why are we the way we are at least. Fantastic. I think that's a perfect point to finish on. Um, thank you very much, Professor Gevort. That was a wonderful, a wonderful um, exposition. Thank you very much for having me. How do you like them apples? Pretty delicious, you must agree. Thank you to the good professor for speaking so loquaciously and making the time. Thanks also to Routledge for the book. As before, have a look at the podcast description for links to Gevort's professional profile and for links to the book. Please share this episode abundantly. And like, follow and subscribe to Airs for Architecture too. And thanks for listening. Cheers. <laughs>